is troubled longing for hope many despair your word alone has power to save us make us your living Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship this morning. We warmly welcome our guests who are worshiping with us today, our regular members as well. Those of you who are worshiping with us online, we welcome you. I would encourage everyone to read the announcements for yourselves, which you can find printed 
in the bulletin. And just to bring a couple to your attention, there are still items that are needed for the blessing box, toilet paper, paper towels, toiletries, and snacks that can go out there, um, snacks that are dried so that the sun and the weather doesn't affect them out there in the blessing box. And also on August 30th at 7 p.m., we will have Gordon Austin here and Holy Fire, and everyone is welcome to that worship too as well. So if you're able to make time for that, I highly recommend that you come. It really is a special time of praise and worship and prayer. Well, my brothers and sisters, as you prepare your hearts and minds this morning to praise God, to welcome God into our midst, Remember that Jesus Christ is here in this time and in this place. It is Jesus Christ who stands at the door of our heart and who knocks. And when we open that door and we invite him in, he has promised to come and be with us and to dwell within us. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you now to open your hearts, open your minds, open your spirits as we begin to worship God. Please join me in prayer. Loving and holy God, we thank you. We praise you for this time of worship. We thank you for the freedom that we have to praise you, to pray as one body in Christ Jesus. And we ask your grace to come upon us, for your peace to fill our hearts and our minds, and your love to comfort and to bind us ever more closely to you and to one another. And we ask that this time of worship may be a blessing, a blessing to you and a blessing to us. In Christ's name, we ask these things. Amen and amen. And my brothers and sisters, I invite you now to stand and join together in our opening song of praise. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. If you'd like to follow along in the music, you can find the music in the celebration hymnal 210, but the words will also be up on the screen.
And my brothers and sisters, while you're still standing, please turn to someone near to you and offer them the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may God's peace be with all of you. God's peace. As you find your way back to your seats and we take up once again our order of worship we come to the time when we offer our confession silently to God because it reminds us that we are all in need of the mercy and compassion and forgiveness of our God for us in Christ Jesus. And as we accept these beautiful gifts, we in turn are called to extend them just as readily to one another. So at this time, I invite you to join together in our prayer of humility, which you can find printed in the bulletin and words also on the screen. Loving God, you offer to us Christ Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Yet, we often want the easy way out. When things go wrong, we want to find who is to blame for our misfortune. When we don't get what we want, we want to punish whoever prevents us from our goals and desires. We don't want to look at the ways in which we have perverted your love for us. We act like spoiled children who want everything immediately and who will become sullen and spiteful if we don't get what we ask for. Forgive our selfish and angry ways. Have mercy on us and heal our souls. And hear us now as we silently confess our sins to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, the truth is that God is slow to anger and full of compassion. God forgives all who humbly repent and trust in Christ Jesus. There is now, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Please join together in our baptismal promises. Through the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ and are raised with him. With gratitude and with faith, we will walk the way of Christ. This is the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Please stand. from the Hebrew Bible, 1 Kings 19, 1 through 15. Ahab had told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake, 
baked on hot stones in a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. <clears throat> then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel as king over Aram. Second reading is letters of the Ephesians, chapter 4, 25 to 5, 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from, your, from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I have to admit that that first reading from um, 1 Kings 19, 1 through 15, is one of my favorite passages in the scripture. That wonderful image of this faithful prophet hiding in this cave, and it's actually supposed to reflect a dark night of the soul that he's in a depression. 
because he's worked so diligently for God and feels like God has abandoned him because um, the king and his wife were ready out for him to kill him. And yet God shows up in all these wonderful ways, feeds him, sends an angel to him, and then speaks to him in that darkness and in that quiet. And there was a great poem written that talks about how this lightning and thunder comes, and then we hear this beautiful line, um, to listen and to speak, you still calm voice of God, speak through the earthquake, the wind, and the fire. That reminds us that God is there also in those dramatic moments as much as God is there in the quiet moments. So even in these moments when we prepare to hear the gospel, we call it a gospel because it means the good news. So we could just as well say, let us prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the good news that we hear from the writer of John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 35 to 51. And before I read that, I would invite you to settle yourselves even more deeply within this presence of God we believe is here, not only within us, but overshadows us, guides us, speaks to us, reveals the wisdom and the intelligence of the scripture, fills us with the light of understanding the Holy Spirit. And so we welcome you, loving God, through the power of your Holy Spirit. We welcome your still, calm voice. That speaks through every experience in our lives. It speaks to us your truth in the experience of Jesus and the disciples and those who are around him in this gospel story. We thank you that this truth still speaks to us today and reveals something new and wonderful each time we come to it open and ready to listen, to be transformed, to be guided and directed by you. And we ask that your grace will overshadow our hearing and our listening, that anything that distracts us from your living truth may be removed and that our focus may be upon you. May we consume the bread of heaven, the good news, the good food, and may our souls be filled, our minds guided, and our hearts relieved. And we thank you again for this living truth. In Christ's name, amen. Now, the whole chapter of John 6 is all about Jesus Christ talking about himself as the bread of heaven, the bread of life. And he says to them again, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing at all that he has given to me, but raise it up on the last day. And this is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. And then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven. And Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. And everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. 
He has seen the Father. But very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life, and I am the bread of life. And your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. And this is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. We shouldn't miss that John keeps repeating over and over these words of Jesus. I am the bread of life, I'm the bread of life, I'm the bread, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. And we might wonder why that is. And it's to really make a point so we begin to ponder what it is he's saying. And we tend to filter these scriptures through our Americanized Christian lens. Not a bad thing, but this really wasn't written just for us. It was written for people in a world and in a particular time and place and culture who thought about bread and God and life and death a lot differently than we do. When I think about bread, I think about that warm bread that comes out of the oven. And if you can't eat that kind of bread, you have my deep sympathy. We have a lot of people now who can't take in gluten. But I think we all can begin to understand if we put this image in our mind and, and we begin to consider the smell of what this is, the taste, the texture of what this is. We can't wait to put it into our mouth. We might get a sense of where Jesus is going with this. And really what he's saying is, we are what we eat and we are what we drink. And eating and drinking here in this scripture are metaphors. He's not talking literally about bread and wine. But what we take in is what we are and what we can't, what comes out of us, out of our mouth, witnesses to what we take in. And that's the point of this gospel. What we eat and what we drink, this is how Jesus presents himself, not as an idea, not as a concept, and not as a theory to be argued about, but as food, as food. And it's a beautiful metaphor because food can only be liked and disliked. And think about that. It either tastes good or it doesn't. You take it in, you digest it, you chew on it, you absorb it, and it's so much bigger a sensation, a feel, an experience than just an idea. Jesus presents himself as good food, life-giving food, sustained food as good bread. And in this day and age, bread was the staff of life. It's often why we see wheat in windows or in different places, always in a Jewish temple. You'll see some form of wheat and grapes on the vine. It's one of the most powerful images in scripture. The staff of life, that's what Jesus presents himself as, and yet, if you think about it, especially now in our culture, food for the mar most part should be consumed as a way for our bodies to create energy. And when I was in seminary, one of my colleagues who happened to be a competitive swimmer, when we would sit around and eat junk food while we were studying or discussing something, she would always bemoan that we don't understand and we forget that our bodies are machines that need good fuel to make healthy energy. That's why we take in the food we take in. If we're intentional, it's about fueling this machine to make healthy energy. And of course, she was making this point while we were shoveling in a lot of junk food, mindlessly, if you will, because it's so easy to forget. We get so distracted about good food and about bad food. 
and the fact that there is food that gives life, and quite frankly, there's food that'll take the life right out of you. And the fact that Jesus begins to portray himself as this living bread, as this bread that comes down from heaven, as manna from the hand of God, that's why he begins to talk about this, because when the Jewish people remembered man in the desert, they knew it only could have come from the hand of God, that it disappeared and it didn't last and they still died, but he's talking about eternal life and salvation, about good food. And yet, sandwiched in this gospel, in this good news today, is a story that tells us about some people, if you will, who have eaten bad food. They're the murmurers. They're the complainers. Those who always have to find something wrong, something to argue about, isn't Jesus, this Jesus, the son of Joseph? Don't we know his mother, his father, and some of the Gospels, his sisters, his brothers? He's from our village, isn't he the carpenter's kid? Who does he think he is? I think that's quite a phrase here in Western Pennsylvania. Who thinks she is? Who do they think they are? And I often hear that. I really, I do. I know they're people. I know they're kind. I know their type. How can they know anything? I can tell you, and on it goes. But our small town city is not that much different from where Christ Jesus lived. And we often judge people around us, just like the people in his time did. And we so easily get caught up in murmuring and complaining against one another. So easily we get sucked into that. And quite frankly, that's eating bad food. And we need to remember that what we eat is who we are. And I'm going to keep repeating that because we need to get it. That's why John keeps repeating it in his gospel. If we find ourselves in negative circles of people and discussions and conversations, if we find ourselves complaining and judging negatively like those around us, if we find ourselves attracted to untruths and gospel, if we find ourselves attracted to either always hating or on one side always loving where we're not paying attention to the truth, whereas it's, it's extremes. It's a problem. And quite frankly, it's bad food. And that way of living, my brothers and sisters, that way of living is letting someone else and something else that is negative control your life. That's why we have these stories that show here's life and here's death. When they talk about death, people jump to that right away as though it's talking about the very end of your life. It's talking about being dead now. If you allow yourself to live in this negative, hateful, judging way, you're letting something else that is not of God direct your life. You are what you take in, what you consume. That's what you become. And if you only have one source that informs you, other than God, other than the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, one negative source or person who directs or controls your thinking and your decisions and the information that you receive and consider it's bad food. And you need to be able to discern that, to think critically enough with wisdom and intelligence to understand that that's what's happening. What a person becomes with that kind of food, that, that really that bad food, creates a dualistic thinker arbitrary, an angry thinker, because a person consuming that kind of food, if you will, that breeds negativity, 
can neither balance themselves or live in society or in our world that somehow has an understanding of compassion and justice, God's justice, mercy, and grace. The sixth chapter of John keeps insisting and telling us that Jesus is the bread of life, the good food. That's what he's telling us the life-giving food, the salvation of the world, the power of God, the power to forgive, the power to transform, the power to give you life. Eternal life now, eternal life means being in the presence of God. You're able to do that now. It's what the mystics and the saints tell us. It's what Jesus is telling us. And then later to be in that full presence where you see God. Jesus is saying you don't have to wait. It's now. You want that, or you want death. I mean, those are the two sides. You want that food that can transform and sustain and establish you as a faith-filled disciple, or you don't. And if you think about it, for the most part of the ministry and the life of Jesus in these stories, he's positive, he's upbeat, He does not lash back, but speaks the truth in love. He's hopeful. He's living. Don't you want to be that way? I do. And yet we live in a time where we have almost grown comfortable with meanness, hate-filled speech and actions, yelling at each other on the road, throwing up hand gestures, beeping horns, passing in these awful ways on the highway where you could take the life of a person. So angry, so angry. Violence against person in place. And we have grown comfortable with that bad life-sapping food. And it is not from God. There is only one other kind of food that's not from God. And that latter food feeds people who don't seem to mind being lied to. And that should scare us a little bit. The scripture is very clear that there will come a time when people will call good evil and evil good. And sometimes I think we're more and more in that time and we can't even see it because of what we're taking in. We have more angry people, more people jumping to conclusions than we do. Calm, peaceful, joy-filled, Christ-like people. And that doesn't mean a person who doesn't see reality. That means a person that sees reality very, very clearly for what it is. And those are the people that are eating good food. And if you think about it, Jesus Christ was only angry a few times. And he was angry at evil. And that's the same kind of angry we should be if we're angry at all. At evil. And injustice. And what did he do about it? He always acted in a way that he knew the Father was directing him to act. And the one time he really should have been angry was when he was on the cross. And yet what we hear is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And in many ways, my brothers and sisters, when I feel my own kind of coming up, I've been able to write that on my heart because I know when I'm saying that, I'm including myself because I don't always understand and I don't always get it. But we get more when we begin to forgive from our heart than we do when we spew out hatred and anger. Jesus Christ never did that. He was angry at evil when unrighteous behavior kept those around him 
from seeing the truth and hearing the truth of his father. He was angry when he cleansed the temple, when he called the temple leaders vipers when they falsely sought baptism to appear self-righteous for the forgiveness of their sins. And when he admonished Peter with the phrase, Satan, get thee behind me, he did not lash out the times his truth was challenged. And that's what we see today. People talked about him, made fun of him, gossiped about him, and he didn't lash out. He kept chipping away at unbelief, knowing this, my brothers and sisters. It took hundreds of years for people to get it wrong. We often can't get it right overnight unless we're like Paul on the road to Damascus and we're healed instantly, and there are fewer of us than that. It's a process, faith is. And we have these stories to remind us that Jesus kept chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And he came into these situations knowing there would be pushback. And he was ready because his work, if you will, his point of being there was always to usher in the kingdom of God and reveal the truth of God and present salvation for humanity because we're almost always in this place where we need it, where it's what can give us life. And that's the food we should take in, what we should consume, remembering what we put in, what comes out, what we eat, we become. And the proof of that is when we open our mouth or when we act in some way that goes against what we know is the truth of God. And that's what we call sin. And if we want to grow up as people, as a human race, if we want to mature and develop as a human race, especially as disciples in Christ Jesus, then we have to begin eating better food and to be aware of what we are putting into our mind, what we are believing in our heart. And if we find ourselves in negative, murmuring, complaining situations and what we're listening to or what we're reading, and quite frankly, especially about things that simply don't matter, that are petty. We should probably come to the conclusion pretty quickly that we're taking in some bad food. You are what you eat, Jesus is telling us. You are what you drink. Do you want the food and the drink that gives you life? or takes the life right out of you, that's your choice. For remember this, you are the body of Christ. You consume him, that fuel that builds a healthy, strong, good energy for this reason, so that you are able to do the work of God, your utmost, if you will, for his glory. Amen and amen. And my brothers and sisters, as you consider and you ponder the ways in which the Holy Spirit may have spoken to your mind and your heart today, I invite you to join together in our song of hope. I am the bread of life. And I, this is a little different, right? This is a little different today, right? It says sing verses one and two and then sing the refrain. You're gonna think, sing three, four, and five. Right, it makes, I did this intentionally to Great. follow what the gospel is. We're going to knock Perfect. Up. We're gonna sing the verses so it tells the story. Perfect. And we're only singing the refrain twice. Thank you. That's great. All right, That's we're correct. taking in some good food then. Yeah. All right. I think so. All right. I am the bread of 
Loving and holy God, we dedicate these gifts to you this morning, not only these gifts, but all the gifts that come through this congregation. The ideas, the time, the ability, all of it, we dedicate this to you this morning. Trusting the fact that those who will use and direct the gifts will be filled with your Holy Spirit will be guided with your sense of peace, justice, righteousness, and mercy, so that these gifts will be used for the relief of need, the good of people, the good of the world, and the good of the church. And we thank you again for the multitude of blessings that we have within this congregation. Amen and amen. Thank you. Please be seated, friends. And as we come into this time of prayer, I would also um, invite you to keep in your prayer the Sailor and the Data families. Many of you know them. Um, they have been coming here a little over a year, I think. And um, Beverly and Doug's son-in-law died suddenly um, this past week, and the funeral's tomorrow. So please keep them in your prayer also our other joys and concerns that are there, and the family of Mary Elizabeth Jenkins. Many of you may remember, remember Mary. She was here for many years, and she died last week as well. Her funeral was on Friday. So keep her family in your prayers too, would you please? 
and calm your hearts and your minds. Recognize that Christ is within you through the power of his spirit, that that same spirit is here surrounding us, guiding us, calming us, feeding us, quenching our thirst. And we thank you, loving God, that you are so present to us in our deepest joys and our deepest concerns. And we thank you that as we name those things before you and adding Madeline Ubery, who has gone to college, her family traveling with her, our families that are traveling back and forth in these last vacations and days of summer. We thank you that before a word is ever across our tongue, before it comes into our mind, you are already aware, so aware of everything that is needed in every situation, in every person, in everything. May we be willing to seek your still, calm voice that does speak through the earthquake, the wind, and the fire, O oh God. And we lift these things to you today, even those things that we keep within the deep silence of our hearts and our minds. And we know, Lord, sometimes there are not even words, or we just don't have them. We just desire to be calm and still before you. And we thank you that you understand that as well as an intentional form of praise. And we thank you for that. And we ask that more and more this week, that no matter what comes to us, as we welcome each new day and everything that it may bring, that we would be more and more willing to turn our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our emotions to you, our responses to you. May we be willing to recognize that you are our food, you are our drink. And the more that we allow you to come into our lives, to transform us, to transform our thinking and our beliefs and our actions, the more opportunity our lives can reveal the power and the authority of your kingdom. May we always be willing to preach the good news in every way possible, but most especially in our thoughts, our words, our actions. May we begin to see each other as you see us within your hands, as the gospel tells us. Nothing is lost. Everything belongs to you. May we recognize that all of us belong to you. Whether we like each other, whether we like what we hear, what another person says or does, you don't have to like what that is. And if it's evil to speak against it, your truth and love, but to be willing to stay at the table, to listen, to discuss, to continually reveal your truth, as Christ Jesus always was willing to do. May we begin to hear and see each other as you hear and see us. May we begin to love more as you do, with your righteousness, sense of justice, compassion, mercy, and peace. Be close to those who are grieving, those who are recovering from procedures, surgeries, those who are awaiting those things, those who are hopeless, those who are joy-filled, the homeless, the addicted, 
those who are abused and forgotten, those who are without hope. Surround all of us and everything with your angels. Hedge us in and protect us. Continually call to us and soften our hearts and our minds that we will answer that call. And we thank you, loving God, that as we lift all of our deepest joys and concerns to you this day, we trust the fact that you take them into yourself and through the power of your Holy Spirit, we believe that life truly is transformed so that we might rest assured that in the end, in Christ Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, that behold, makes all things new, that all shall be made well. All shall be made well. All manner of life shall surely be made well. And we believe you hear us now in the prayer that Christ Jesus has given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, as we close our service today, I invite you to stand and join together in this closing song of peace, when peace, like a river, you can find it in the bulletin and also words on the screen.
brothers and sisters, remember you have the life of Christ within you. The kingdom of God is within you. The good news is within you. You are called to take this out into the world and to never be afraid. For it is Jesus Christ who strides out before you. He goes ahead of you. He prepares a place for you. He waits there for you. And when you lose your way, I guarantee you, he will turn back on that road to meet you. And I bless you now in the power of our living, loving God, our Abba Father, who loves you more than you could ever imagine, whose love sent Jesus Christ into this world to reveal the life, the truth, and the way, and the Holy Spirit that binds you to God and to one another. Alleluia and amen. Have a wonderful week, friends. Oh,